Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Before I introduce today's guest, I do want to let you know that my book, Unprocessed, is on sale on Amazon for 30% off. If you send me a receipt that you bought the book or a screenshot, even if you bought it a long time ago, to chefajbonus at yahoo.com, I will send you a class I did that I sell for $25. It's a comprehensive dessert class. It has my strawberry chocolate cheesecake recipe, which isn't in this book, a PDF of the recipes, just to thank you for buying the book. And if you bought the book a long time ago, that's fine. You can still find your receipt on Amazon. So check it out. Thank you so much. So I have a really amazing guest today. Her name is Ruth Morley, and she hikes like a maniac. Oh, she's been hiking all over, but she does it on a whole food plant-exclusive diet, SOS-free. So she's going to tell us how she did it, how she feels and looks great. You're not going to believe it. She's 70 years old. Please welcome her to the show. I, you look amazing, Ruth. Welcome thank to the show. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Chef AJ. It is such a thrill to be here. I. It's really a strange experience to be on this side of the screen now and no, I'm actually talking to you because I talk well, to you during your shows, but you never hear me. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to meet you. I, Ann Esselson said that you are, you would be a great guest and I could just, oh, tell that's I, watched, wonderful. I watched another interview. Well, your story is so interesting. Yeah, it's interesting. It's even more interesting with, with each added year of age. People are much more interested. They expect you to be at home in a rocking chair. And well, you I, are I'm definitely not. not in a rocking chair. You're, you're, I mean, that, it's, it's amazing what you're accomplishing and accomplishing it on this diet. At, look, tell me your whole story about how you became such an avid hiker, when you became plant based, and why SOS free. I turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. Well, I do want to share a lot about my hiking, but first I thought I'd just tell people how I did come to this way of eating because I'm completely sold on it. Um, as a child, I hated all food, basically. I was just a little twig. Um, I especially hated vegetables. And every night at dinner time, I would get a stomach ache because I'd hear the pressure cooking going. Ch -ch -ch. I hated that thing because there was meat and potatoes in there. And I hated just about everything. And I'd always have a st stomach ache afterwards. Uh, in college, even, I was still thin. My husband introduced me to putting cheese on a hamburger. That just sounded so odd to me. Um, and I remember saying to my roommates that I wish I could just take a pill and not even eat food, and then I'd be happy. Uh, but as an adult, I started to like more foods, and I would play with five or 10 extra pounds, but never more than that. So I stayed slim. But in my 30s, we, late 30s, I had my cholesterol checked. It was the first time maybe I'd heard of it, and it was high. And my family history is heart attacks. And I, so I started an awareness there, tried different things, American Heart Association diet, nothing happened. Dr. Dean Ornish was out there. That looked way too extreme, for it, so I didn't even want to go that way. Uh, meanwhile, my cholesterol was high. I had prediabetes, which got worse and worse. I had hypothyroidism. I started having aches and pains and arthritis in my 40s. Even though I was active, you can't exercise yourself into good health. And so I got injured on the Appalachian Trail and I was on the sofa. I, I had to use crutches. I had stress fractures in both sides of the pelvis. And I watched Game Changers on Netflix and that did it. I said, here is the healthy way to eat that's going to really help me. And I couldn't believe it. I shared it with my husband. He joined me in it. It was three years ago when COVID was starting. In two weeks, I felt wonderful. I put the crutches aside. Um, it didn't heal the bones immediately. They were already healed. It meant healed me up here. Um, and then I discovered Esselstyn. And <laughs> I started following his program. And my cholesterol dropped a uh, hundred points, a hundred points from its highest, from 293 to 193. Um, my I'm no longer prediabetes, that brought tears to my eyes more than the cholesterol. I felt wonderful. My husband felt good because he was following it more or less. Being COVID, we were stuck at home and eating the same way. And we could wake up 
get up in the morning, we're in our late 60s, and we used to hobble down the hall to the bathroom, you know, have to do stretching first before, before we could do it. Now we could just get up and go. And we do that still. We cannot believe how it's helped the hike, the um, aches and pains. It also helped my hypothyroidism. I cut my medications in half. Um, so I'm, I'm totally sold on it. I educated myself as much as I could. I continue. I have so many books. I watch you daily. I've learned so much. I love Plant Strong. Uh, I love um, Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine exam room. They have a wonderful podcast. I just continue to learn. But I have to put a plug in for my Facebook group. It, you guys know who I'm talking. I'm talking to you. This is called the 100% Esselstyn Reversal Nutrition Forum. And it's thousands of people. Someone's watching this from Israel right now. And it's not run by Esselstyn, but it has two amazing moderators, Joanne Downey and Derek Duff. And they keep us on the straight and narrow. And it is just wonderful. We, don't, we help newcomers and we encourage each other. So I really recommend it. So, yeah, I just feel wonderful. I feel 20 years younger. Every now and then I'll get a reminder. I don't run upstairs much anymore. But um, I did much of the exercise I'll be talking about, the adventures while I was eating a regular standard American diet or the paleo diet, which I thought was good for me. But I did it all despite how my body felt. It still ached. Now I do all these things because of how good my body feels. So. That's pretty much my history. Um, I am sold on this for the rest of my life. And I'm so grateful my husband eats as I do. And so now I'd like to share more about, about my activities. And I can't wait too. So this, the mountains are calling and I must go, John Muir. And that is Mount Katahdin the northernmost point of the Appalachian Trail. I'm guessing some, maybe a couple people there who are watching today recognized it. Um, I'm just so happy to have this opportunity to share my two passions with all of you. Um, my first, I would say my first and foremost, whoops, I'm trying, there we go. First and foremost is eating whole food plant-based and this whole lifestyle, which I've been, I'm now in my fourth year. And my other is spending time moving by foot or by bike in nature, which I began in earnest 26 years ago. I wanna take you behind the scenes today, a peek behind the curtain, how many of these adventures were able to be moved from dreams to reality and how eating whole food plant-based SOS free played into this. Everybody's in, different, I understand in their interests, abilities and circumstances, but I hope that some of my experiences will inspire you to expand your own horizons in whatever you consider your interests or passions. First, I wanna share with you my journey into some of these adventures. Growing up, my family was not sports oriented at all. Uh, getting up to change the channel on the TV was my big movement of the day when my father asked me to from the comfort of the sofa. I remember in high school watching Jack LaLanne on TV as I laid horizontal on the sofa and eating grilled brown sugar and butter sandwiches. I kid you not, it did taste good, I have to admit. Um, influenced my, by my boyfriend, later my husband, I began to be more active and I discovered running in the 1970s and my 20s because it was all the craze, but just short distances. But then, for me, if something's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. So I began running marathons in my 40s, 26.2 miles or longer. Long distances just clicked with me. In my journal after my first marathon, I wrote, today was the first day of the rest of my marathoning life. For the next 16 years, I ran 52 marathons. The longest two were 100 kilometers, 62 miles. And I did this in 19 U.S. states, 11 countries, and on five continents. I'm only lacking Asia and Australia. We've been there. We've lived in one of them, but I didn't do marathons. 
I've always enjoyed hiking too, but I pursued it more in my 40s when our family lived in Japan, where we climbed Mount Fuji and we trekked in Nepal and Thailand. Later, we lived in the French Alps in our early 50s when I was enticed by the mountains to begin tackling a trail called the GR5. This stretches 1,500 miles through five countries from the North Sea to the Mediterranean. The southern 500 miles were all through the Alps. Let me tell you, it changed my life. I did this trail a month at a time for three summers. Then we moved back to the US and I joined my close friend biking regularly. Of course, we had to overdo it. We, my butt friend who'd already cycled across the Northern US, we decided to ride across the Southern. This is called the Southern Tier. It's a 3000 mile route that you follow. It's not all bike trail, it's regular trail, regular roads too. We followed this from California to Florida in 60 days. And there we are in uh, dipping our back tires in the Pacific. On returning to the US, I did this, um, I, I did hiking and cycling in both US and France. When we did return permanently to the US, of course, hiking, I decided <laughs> I couldn't resist the lure of the AT, the Appalachian Trail, but we call it AT for short. It's 2,200 miles stretching through 14 states from Georgia in the south to Maine in the north, very challenging in some sections. Yes, the trail goes right up that ridge. That is approaching Mount Katahdin at the end. Amazing. More recently, I have been working on the Buckeye Trail, which encircles our state of Ohio. Two years ago, I began this, and I'm going to do it for another two or three years, just whenever I have the right time the time for it. And the weather's good. I wait for good weather on that one. I've done half of it and I'll continue through the next few years. And in January, I like to get out of Ohio if possible. So this year I began the 1100 mile Florida National Scenic Trail, which runs north from Big Cypress National Preserve in the Everglades, up above Orlando, and then west into the Panhandle to finish near Pensacola. I hiked the third of the trail this January, and I intend to continue each January for two more years. This year's section was full of some amazing, unique natural settings. Unbelievable. This is Big Cypress, which was difficult, but the most rewarding and amazing. Planning, preparation, and perseverance. I've done lots of exciting adventures. There's even more I haven't told you about. Life has been good to us. But it takes a lot of effort to successfully pull them off. Today, I'd like to share with you the process that has evolved when I start considering an adventure or excursion. These three general practices lead me towards success, planning, preparation, and perseverance. And they are especially important for the senior hiker. And you can also apply these to living a healthy lifestyle. The whole food plant-based diet, exercise, stress reduction, importance of sleep, et cetera. Most definitely apply. A goal without a plan is just a wish. So many people have said to me, I've thought about doing the Appalachian Trail. And I say, look at your calendar, plan it. There's four questions to consider in making a plan. The first is what? What is it that you really want to do? Do you truly want it? Does it match up with your abilities and desires and present circumstances? If it's a hike or a movement, what's the route and what kind of resources are available? Lodging and food. When would you do it? How is your schedule and what time do you have available? And what is best for this trail or this activity? What the weather and the climate? For instance, in the Arizona desert, you would go, I think in late March, it would be best before it gets too hot, but it's not quite as cold. 
high in the Colorado Rockies, which I'll find about, out about this next summer, I'll be starting late July and hiking in August because most of the snowpack will be gone and new snow won't be falling, hopefully. How long will you be out there? Will it be day hikes, section hikes, or doing the whole trail all at once? How will you do this? For the hiking, I choose my start and my finish. Uh, you can do leaping around different areas of the trail as I've done with the Buckeye Trail. Will you do it solo or with other hikers or with a mix? And will you need support from others with uh, food, water, travel? There was a book that really helped me answer the question of why. Appalachian Trials, cute play on words from trails. Why do you want to do this? And he has, the author has three main questions, and it all applies to the AT, but it also applies to food. I'm hiking the Appalachian Trail because why? Craving adventure, time to reevaluate, to set a good example. For food, for me, it's lengthening my lifespan, but most importantly, my health span to be able to actively play with grand, great grandchildren and maybe even see them get married. When I, the, another question, when I successfully hike the AT, I will have unshakable confidence, have a story of a lifetime. Regarding food, I will, when I successfully follow whole food plant-based diet, I will feel better physically and mentally. I'll have optimal weight. I'll avoid chronic diseases, and I can reduce and eliminate my medications. Third question, if I give up on the AT, I will never believe in myself, not be the person I believe I am. With food, if I give up on whole food plant-based, I'll be disappointed in myself, but then I will forgive myself and I will resume because I know it's the best thing for me. So you've decided on your trip now. Now what? By preparing, failing to prepare, you are preparing to fail. This also applies to whole food plant-based, such as preparing for social gatherings, eating out, travel. We all find that challenging and we can all find those systems. I did lots of research, books, guidebooks, just as I have for this way of eating. I listened to others on YouTube who had done these experiences. I continue to do it for every trail I'm going to do. Um, I carried on trail a small guidebook and I also had an app that showed, um, this is called Gut Hook. It now go, that was a fellow's um, nickname on the trail. Now it goes by far out, just a new name. And it just shows the elevation and it shows when there's shelters, places to stay on the trail. It shows where there's water sources. You see the water droplets, uh, where there's picnic areas, shows your elevation. It also shows a map form and it shows exactly where I am on the trail. I've used that many times when I've made a wrong turn and I can get back to the trail. After all this is done, then for my adventures, I write an itinerary. This is a rough itinerary. You can see lots of changes as I'm considering where to stay, where to send my food to a post office or a hostel, which I'll get into more later. Um, I always start with modest uh, mileage at the beginning. You see in the third column, it says 7.3 miles, then the next day is eight miles, then 9.6. I gradually build it up over the next week, depending on the distance, the train, my training. It, this is a marathon. These just going for a week or more, even two days. It's not a sprint. Very, very important to include zero days. I see about right in the middle of that page, zero in bland, lovely name of a town. And a zero is when you go zero days and you rest and you resupply your food, and you, I, write my blog. You also have food boxes sent to you. This was up at a big, very well-known hostel, Shaw's in Monson, Maine, and that people send their food there, and they put those in the, take the food out of the packs and put it in their backpacks. 
Uh, there's also Nero days when you have reduced mileage. So it's nearly a zero, so it's called a Nero. Then you get into looking at your lodging. The Appalachian Trail is very unique in that it has 250 or more shelters or lean-tos, they're called, five to 15 miles apart on its 2,200 mile length. Very unique. I know of no other trail that has that. This is where hikers, as you can see, someone's throwing down their mat. You can sleep on the wooden floor. Uh, many are bigger and can sleep 12. These have privies, water source nearby. I liked camping on the grounds of the shelter for my privacy. This is, was my tent at the time, but got to talk with other hikers. It also has ways to store your food while you sleep at night. Uh, to protect it from the animals. There's a pole sometimes. You use a, a long forked metal rod to get your bag up there. Some have bear boxes, they call them. The bears haven't figured out quite yet how to get into your food there. Or people hang their food. You follow that yellow line and you see a bag of food hanging. Bear, it's right by a tree. Bears climb trees. So this is not such, I hung this one and I did not hang it well. There's other options for food protection I'll present later. Sleeping in tents. I prefer a tent to the shelter unless it's raining. Um, this is an unofficial camping area along the trail. You can sleep, that's my white tarp there. You can sleep in a commercial campgrounds or you can sleep alone. Uh, in nature, if it's not a protected area, they call it stealth hiking. Another place to sleep are hostels, which are for hikers or travelers who like more budget accommodations. This is one of the most famous Woods Hole. Um, I'm thinking it's in Virginia, if I recall correctly. And it is just lovely. This one is very interesting. It was a converted church. But inside all of these, you'll find some kind of a bunking system and sometimes private rooms for people. And it's very inexpensive. It's like 25 a night or something and there's showers and often a kitchen you can use. I've stayed in hotels, motels, Airbnbs, but that's the most unique. I knew this would be in a garage yep. <laughs> on the Gut Hook app. App, people share information in their comments, but it was pouring rain. And as I like to tell people, any carport in a storm. This worked out fine. Uh, concrete's a little hard to sleep on, even with the air mattress, but I took it. He was very generous. He let a lot of people sleep in that, in his garage. Uh, Appalachian Mountain Club also has eight beautiful lodges. They call them huts. That's no hut. Uh, they have many more, but they have eight that are in New Hampshire and Maine, very near the Appalachian Trail. And you need to reserve them months in advance, but true hikers or long distance hikers can work for stay, sweep up the kitchen, wash dishes and sleep on the floor of the dining room. Now begins the training, very important for the older hiker. Uh, they need to, you need to be walking at least three to four times a week and gradually increase your distance and difficulty. Do a lot of cross training. I do Pilates, I do yoga, I do strength training. Uh, then you start, then you start adding your backpack and you gradually make it longer. And I did shakedown hikes before each long distance trail trail for one or two nights of camping. Uh, totally out of my backpack to get good practice in. It really helped. Now we look at gear. Carry as little as possible, but choose that little with care. This is the first man who hikes the complete distance of the AT. That's what through hiker is. Um, and he's right. The goal is to have in your backpack whatever you need to be comfortable and safe while hiking and camping and nothing more. It's so different from car camping, we say, when you can take as much, as whatever you can fit in the car. You can take a tent that houses four people. You can take bedding, huge amounts of bedding items, gas cook stoves, camp chairs, et cetera. When backpacking, you are packing for one person in your pack, unless you have a child with you. And the lighter the load, the easier the trail, the flatter the mountains become and begin 
become and the fewer overuse injuries. You take the things you really need, not just one. And it's a process getting to that. Oh my goodness. Yes, my first one was on the left. I've never quite gotten to the right. Uh, the goal is to try to have under 20 pounds in your base weight, which means the pack itself and all the non-consumable items in it, not including food and water. That's how people measure it. Some people in the past have carried up to 50 to 70 pounds. pounds. The scouts are known for being prepared for everything. The ultra light people nowadays carry 10 pounds or less. I am not in that ballpark. I usually have 13 to 15 pounds and then I add food and water. People love talking about gear, just as we love talking about food. Uh, they begin to examine every single item. My pack is on the left. Uh, my tent is in the bright yellow bag at the top, and then a pillow below it, and then an air mattress. They, if you get, if you lower the weight of the heaviest items first, you see the biggest results. Uh, people use scales and make spreadsheets. So the backpack. That is not on the Appalachian Trail. That's my husband when we were trekking in, the, in Thailand, and that is an external frame backpack. Those were back in the day. We did this in the 1980s. Uh, still, some people use them. They're very comfortable and they can hold a lot. I've seen them on the trail. Um, when I was on the GR5, the one that ran through the Alps, my backpack looks very big. This had an internal frame, metal framing inside the pack. I have rain clothes stacked on top, I believe, but I did not need that big of a pack. I was staying in hostels the whole way. I had too much stuff with me, but it was a wonderful trip. Then I found this book. I learn by reading. Uh, Trail Life, very well-known man, Ray Jardine in the climbing and the ultra lightweight backpacking world. Uh, I learned about eliminating excess items and lighter gear. And I continue to work on that. Ray Jardine sells kits for making your own gear and clothing. It's amazing. And they it's top quality stuff. And so I began sewing his items. That's his, one of his backpacks I'm working on. I swam, swung completely complete opposite direction from too big and heavy to the very lightest. My biggest pack weighed five pounds. This one weighed 10 ounces. However, you see there's no frame whatsoever, just a nylon bag with padded straps. So you have to pack very lightweight or you're going to get pain. There's another one. I made three different sizes of his. Mine's on the left. My husband's on the right. He joins me. Uh, the, for a few days on a, almost every long distance trail I do. I loved these. I used them on the southern half of the AT, but my loads were just too heavy and my shoulders and back hurt. So I switched to the ULA circuit, which I really love. Has the internal frame, still lightweight at two pounds, much more comfortable, hip belt with pockets, and I still consider it lightweight. Now we move on to the sleeping system. I'm laying in a shelter. Rest is critical and you need a good sleeping on the trail and enough zero days. So again, I followed Ray, Ray Jardine's plan and I made three different length, different weights of his synthetic quilts. A quilt is like a sleeping bag, it has, but it has a pocket for your feet and it's open in the back so you're not as enclosed and it's better it's good in um all sorts of weather then you can open it up and use it like a duvet but i wanted i i get sleep cold and i never could carry the right quilt for this so i have i have a quilt now but this one is down i feel like a bad vegan admitting that uh but i just i froze and this one you can pack a lot more warmth in a smaller package with down. So this one I love. Um, and you see an inflatable pad underneath that. This is the interior of my, my tent. And I have an inflatable pillow. Some people stuff a bag with their down jacket. I, and ice cubes, wear my down jacket in bed. So I need a pillow. Shelter system. 
this orange tint is the first one I bought for myself. Never used it. Uh, it has its own tint holes inside. And I learned that that was much heavier. And of course, Ray Jardine has a kit for that to make the tarp that you've seen in previous pictures. So I started sewing. There's all that nylon that I had to sew. It's so rewarding though, so rewarding. And I ended up with that. That's my tent. And I also made the net tent that fits underneath it that keeps the little bugs and things away. And it added a bit of warmth. Tarp is interesting because you don't get as much condensation from your breath at night. So the walls of the tarp do not sweat and drip water on you. And so you can actually stay warmer. And I also made in caps that are adjust I could add if the weather was blowing from all directions. I could almost make that a tent. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, the only reason I have moved on to another piece of gear is because that's what backpackers do. We must own excess gear or we're not happy. But I also know that when I hike in Colorado this summer, storms can come quickly and I need to set up my tarp or tent quickly. And this one goes up quickly, much quicker than the tarp. And I just feel more comfortable being more enclosed in the mountain setting. This has a net interior also. Um, and so it's considered a double walled tent. This is on the Florida Trail. Amazing trail, I love it. Um, so I will continue to use the tarp at times as well. Now we move, up, move on to the food and water system. Uh, this is the stove. You see a red canister. It's resting on the... Um, bear canister that my food is stored in. That's one of the ways I store my food sometimes. It adds a little weight to the pack, but it's fail safe. Bears cannot, do not have quarters or screwdrivers to open those screws to get the lid off, so it's safe. On that is the red canister of gas, and then above that is the little stove, MSR stove, uh, pocket rocket, and then my pot, and I use foil as the lid because it weighs less. But I moved to cold soaking, which this is. There's a plastic container with a lid. I soak my food while I'm hiking. And when I get to camp or at lunch, my food is ready to go. Uh, there's no cooking. I don't have to carry the, the canister. Uh, clean up is so easy. I put water in the container. I swish it around, drink the water, done. Clean up. So this, these are vegetables that I've cooked at home and dehydrated. And on the right is hummus that I've dehydrated. I, I put that on it. I add a little bit of balsamic vinegar you see in a packet. I have tortillas, which by the end of the week of hauling them are tortilla crumbles. But I really love, I love my cold soaking. Um, what, now I'm gonna become judgmental, but bear with me. Many, many backpackers consider hiking a time they can take vacation from common sense and self-care while their body is making such big demands on it. Endless pizzas in town. I have seen people eat Cheerios and M&Ms for dinner. I have seen a grand, grown man eat Ritz with mayonnaise on it for dinner several nights. It makes me sad. It makes me so sad. I do not lecture, but I make sure they see my food. <laughs> so how do I carry and protect my food? I couldn't obviously do the good bear hangs. So there's my bear canister in the middle. I use that sometimes. Um, the Ursac is what I'm settling on most of the time. This There's different levels of these sacks. Ur means bear. Uh, this has a slightly odor-proof bag <laughs> inside. Black bear's sense of smell is 2,000 times that of humans. So I'm sure that odor-proof bag, the bear goes, oh yeah, cute touch, but I still smell the food. Uh, but it's really, it's a great way to store my food. If you tie it securely, they can't get it off. They may mash the hell out of it, but I will eat all my mashed food. It will still taste good. I'll get to more about my food in a moment. Water you collect along the trail and from streams, lakes, um, you filter it. Some people use tablets to filter it. I use a Sawyer squeeze, which is right below my hand holding that blue bag. And I squeeze it and put it into my water bottles then. 
Clothing, there's no such thing as bad weather, only inappropriate clothing. Cotton is rotten, is the saying, because it stays wet, it will not dry. You need UV protective and insect repellent clothing. I have three, I have three different kinds of clothing with me. My hiking clothes that I wear the same thing every day and wash when I get to town. My sleeping clothes, which are upper and lower, lower thermals and a pair of warm socks. And my outer layers, a very lightweight windbreaker, warm layers such as insulated down or synthetic jacket. My rain gear, yes, stylish. A uh, cheap frog togs rain jacket has proved from Walmart has proven to be the very best for me. And a rain skirt, a rain kilt. I don't care if the bottom of my legs get wet. And this way it's less cumbersome to put on and off. My husband prefers a poncho and it covers his backpack. Our backpacks are lined though with a big plastic bag so my things don't get, don't get wet. All right, uh, moving on to boots and shoes. I started with run, trail running shoes with good grip, got tendonitis, moved to boots for the rest of the Appalachian Trail, felt very comfortable in those. Now I'm moving back to the trail running shoes and they have really good grip on them, but you have to replace them about every two to 300 miles. Uh, I also use hiking poles, reduces falls greatly. And with osteoporosis, I need to be aware of it. Uh, practicing safe toilet habits. You see, I have a trowel on the right that digs the hole where I'm going to go number two. In the middle, I have a water bottle dedicated to my own bidet. You see a little aqua, uh, nozzle on it, and that is uh, for squirting your bottom. And then I sp have spare toilet paper. The bidet is a new addition, and I really like it. Uh, it makes you really feel a lot cleaner. And here's another layout. I across the top row is my medical kit. Middle kit row is my personal care. Bottom row is my tech gear. I also carry a spot communicator uh, or an inReach mini that I can hit a SOS button and have immediate communication and help, or I can send um, texts home. Um, I've just become, I've started using that lately. Uh, I also carry a whistle. I do not carry bear spray. You don't need that. Bears just want your food, not you, but I have been known to carry pepper spray just for the human animal, just in case. Exercise is king, nutrition is queen. Put the two together, you've got a kingdom. I would like to say exercise and nutrition are the royal couple. They rule bountifully. Um, so what diet? How do people get their food on the trail? Many, re oh, I jumped ahead a little bit. There we go. Many resupplies they go. Uh, trail towns, the gas stations, Dollar General stores. They get tortillas, tuna packets, nuts and butters, Pop-Tarts, candy, Snickers, or, and they eat out. They love all you can eat out. When I'm in town, I go to the store. I buy whatever fresh food I can get. I try to stay at a place where there's a microwave and refrigerator. And that was a wonderful meal. Microwave sweet potato, which I love as much as you do, Chef AJ. They don't have Oriental in most places, but I'll take whatever. Uh, and food drops from home. People get those as well. You've seen the package, the package earlier. Um, and feed people's favorite snacks, commercially made meals. There's my food, food drop from home. That was enough for uh, 12 days on the trail uh, before I was starting an area where there wouldn't be. I, I had someone to take some of this ahead for me. Anyway. Um, I changed my way of eating in 2020. I did my first three sections of the Appalachian Trail eating paleo, still dehydrated though, but I did the final section as whole food plant-based SOS free. I love this lifestyle. I really recovered so much better each night in the tent. And I, I've done my part of the Florida Trail eating this way and I will forever. This is how I do it. I bought a dehydrator. The Excalibur nine tray, highly recommended, love it. And then I educated myself 
Backpacking Chef has a wonderful website, and these cookbooks tell you everything you need to know. Yes, there's meat recipes in there, but he tells you proportions and how to cook everything. It's fantastic. You can cook complete recipes. This is Sandra's Chili. I believe that is from Esselstyn's Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook, I believe. Um, and then I just put it in Ziploc, individual Ziploc bags. You can dehydrate individual items. I believe in the dehydrator, that is hummus. I spread, no, I'm sorry, not hummus, uh, salsa. On a solid tray, not that mesh tray, I spread out my salsa and let it become hard like a fruit roll up. And then I flip it and put it on the mesh tray. And then I put it in the um, food processor and ground, grind it into a powder. And now I have salsa for the trail. And those other things, those veggies are gonna be part of my lunch. There's my hummus, there's my hummus. I, as I said, it was on a solid silpat tray and then I flipped it so the back would dry evenly. Love it. Uh, so that's how I prepare my foods and storage. Each meal has its own pint size Ziploc and I put snacks in their small Ziplocs. Um, and then I put one meals, it, eat one day's food in a gallon bag. So it's breakfast, lunch, dinner, and four snacks. Um, and some things are stored. If it's not for a long time, it's stored in the deep freeze. Uh, just to last longer. For longer term, term storage, I've started using vacuum sealing a bit in bags or mason jars, but for the trail, I have it in the Ziplocs. My favorite food. Oh, here we go. On the trail and in life. Oatmeal, every breakfast here as well. I ate it before meeting with Chef AJ. In my oatmeal, I have dry oats, sweet potato. Now remember, everything's cubed, cooked, and dehydrated. Dry oats, sweet potato, cauliflower, zucchini, banana, ground flaxseed, cinnamon, powdered vanilla, one packet of Marconi balsamic vinegar to activate the cauliflower so it helps heal my endothelial cells. Thank you, Dr. Esselstyn. Lunch, that's breakfast, that's it. Lunches, I love a mix of veggies, dark leafy greens. I'll throw in a grain, You very often couscous or uh, quinoa powdered salsa and powdered hummus and some Marconi balsamic and tortilla or tortilla crumbles. Here we go. Oh, there on the bottom is nutritious, rich mashed potatoes. Chef AJ, that is from Own Your Own Health, Own Your Health, your book, your recipe. These are mashed potatoes, parsnips, cauliflower, nutritional yeast on the bottom tray. And then I add more veggies to it, but I crumble up the potatoes after it's all dried and put it in the bag and I add more whole veggies. And sometimes I add um, lentils. I, I'm always looking for more calories. I, you always, everybody loses weight when you're spending, expending five, I'm sorry, 5,000, 500 calories an hour hiking. And split pea soup from Dr. Esselstyn's book. I love with added cooked greens, peas, carrots, and a grain. Um, I try to add greens to every meal and some snacks. Dinners, roasted root veggies at, with a grain and lentil. Sandra's chili with sweet potatoes. From the cookbook, um, yeah, I'll Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease cookbook. Stews, curries. I very often have coleslaw greens or cube beets on the side, but beets can be a problem. They stain things if they leak, so I'm careful with those. I go with gluten-free. It makes my arthritis feel better. So I have black or brown rice, quinoa, sorghum, millet, a bit of pasta broken into pieces, but that pokes holes in, in bags. There we are. I started with Chef AJ's recipe for oatmeal cookies from the secrets to ultimate weight loss. And that has just the ingredients, mashed ripe potatoes, bananas, oats, vanilla, and cinnamon, done. Okay, now those are my other ingredients I add to it. Um, I have oats, mashed ripe bananas, or another gooey food, cinnamon, vanilla powder, heard about that on AJ Live, with the addition of any and all of the following. 
finely chopped cooked leafy greens, shredded zucchini, jicama shredded, carrot shredded, parsnip shredded, finely minced red peppers, chopped cooked peas. And I also make a version with beets. That's why that's so red. Yum, yum. I also use pureed pumpkin or mashed sweet potatoes with hickory barbecue balsamic vinegar from Olive Tap. And I throw in quinoa more now too. I want the calories. I usually lose just five pounds. Some people lose much more. Um, and I need the energy. I also make a self-made trail mix, marinated mushrooms, red peppers, zucchini, quartered cherry tomatoes, chickpeas, optional, oh, optional items. I like a grain maybe, dried oats, quinoa, even dehydrated, does not need to be dehydrated, it's crunchy. Uh, Plant Strong, um, Plant Strong has a big bowl cereal. I use a bit of that sometimes, but it does have gluten in it. And, or crumbled brown rice cakes. I make fruit snacks, just a variety of fruits, mandarin, orange sections, apples, pineapple, blueberries, kiwi, bananas, chickpeas thrown in for more starch. And I make a wonderful veggie leather. It's a mix of carrots, parsnips, cinnamon, nutmeg, and orange extract. And it comes out like a really crispy hard fruit roll up. And I'm going to experiment with other veggies and legumes mixed in. And I often have as a snack or as a side dish on dinner or lunch, greens with man cooked dark leafy greens with mandarin orange sections and balsamic or coleslaw with raisins and balsamic. Now I have my cleaned up itinerary and I'm ready to go. I have told my husband where he needs to, he is such a helper. He sends me all my boxes, priority mail. They've all made it all 2,200 miles of the AT and the Florida trail. And I cold soak my food on trail and I eat like a queen. I love my food. It's a wonder I don't gain weight. Um, on the trail, you're off to great places. Today is your day. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. And here's what I'm following as I'm hiking. That white blaze indicates that I am on the Appalachian Trail. And technically, you're supposed to be able to see a blaze in front of you, at least somewhere in the distance. And if you turn around, one behind you. Sometimes there's more, sometimes there's not many. Uh, but you have your app and you have your guidebook. On the AT, a blue blaze indicates a side trail going to water, perhaps, or another trail, or that shiny silver metal uh, roof of a shelter that you see. And I love approaching a shelter at the end of a long, hard day. You hear the laughter of other hikers. You join them at the picnic table, and you have camaraderie. Because when you hike alone, which I love to do, I love being in nature alone, you do miss talking to people, and I talk my head off. This is on, it's a slightly different blue. This is on the Buckeye Trail following the Blue Blaze and on the Florida Trail Orange. I don't care for the color orange much, but I've really come to love it with the Florida Trail. And that sign says campground or something like that. Campsite, campsite, yes. That's, and so that's the Blue Blaze going to the campsite. I've learned to be in the moment and appreciate the journey, not just getting to the destination. Okay, and just a moment, finding where I'm at. Discipline is choosing between what you want now and what you want most. Does that not apply to eating whole food plant-based? I swear. Uh, it's Life is a marathon, not a sprint. And as my hikes, I just take modest mileage the first couple of weeks, very modest, under 10 miles. And I take care of myself along the way with water, good food, daily stretching, meditating. And I do that at home as well. I join up with others, young ladies in their 20s. I am not, I don't allow myself to be led astray by pride or desire or uh, fellow hikers. I wasn't with those girls very long. And the same thing happened starting the Florida Trail. I know my limits. 
and I treat it as a marathon and they are younger and they can spread it, treat it as a sprint. I learned pacing by through my marathons. I had in my hand somewhere there my pacing chart for the Boston Marathon and I I arrived at the exact hour and minute that I thought I would. Doesn't always happen, but I've learned pacing. So I pace myself. Sometimes your trail on the the your way on the trail or in life can be easy and smooth. Sometimes it's rough. That's my husband on the Appalachian Trail. God love him. Um, it can be very rough. Sometimes that's me climbing up to Katahdin. It can be extremely difficult, but you deal with it. You deal with it. People have asked me, what did I love most about the Appalachian Trail or any trails? Being completely immersed in nature. That's how I, one reason I loved the tarp too. And I always choose pretty places for my lunch. The people, the hikers at the shelter, it, it's just wonderful to share stories with them. And the, the um, trail angels, we call them, people who want to help the hikers for free. They are just amazing. This was on the Florida Trail. Even though it's a wet place, sometimes the rivers are full of pollutants. And so locals will leave water for the hikers. It's amazing and they keep up with it. There's another trail angel. And he's also a shuttle driver who will drive you where, to your start of your trail. Sometimes people would like to have a little compensation, but they'll drive you wherever. He took me to a hotel when I was done hiking and he had fruit. And I and water, I was thrilled. Usually it's chips and junk. And I told him I was so craving baked potatoes, I couldn't wait to finish and get them. The next day he found me, I was walking on a uh, the trail was on a road, and he brought me four baked potatoes he had made because he knew the direction I'd be going. It was easy to find me. Unbelievable. This man is now having his own adventure on the Appalachian Trail. You've got to take time to stop and smell the roses. And I hope you do. Chef AG, you work so hard. I, you're so, I so admire you. Um, on While hiking, I took time to get in some lakes. I took a ride in this with some other folks in Maine and saw a moose from the air. Unbelievable. I went to church one Sunday when I had a zero day in town. I made the acquaintance of church ladies who invited me to lunch. <laughs> Look at that. Look what's in front of me. That's chicken, folks. I was paleo at the time. But if I did this now in my pocket or my bag, I would have lunch ready just in case I met people. And then I would eat my whole food plant-based lunch right there as they ate their chicken. So yeah, that's, that's real life. Fall down seven times, stand up eight. That's been the story of my life. Um, I have had so many injuries. I'm putting myself out there and I've had osteopenia, which is now osteoporosis, but I'll get more to that in a second. Uh, on the TR5 in Europe, my first year, I had a meniscus tear. I finished my first third of the trail. I was in the Alps. I finished in pain and had surgery at home. On the GR5, the third year, second year, no injuries. Yay. Uh, second third year to finish it up, I had trail running shoes and they got old and I hadn't realized how old they were and I got terrible tendonitis. I bought a bike on the advice of a doctor I went to see and I finished on the wonderful trails of Holland and sold the bike to a bike shop and recovered at home. Appalachian Trail, <laughs> that is a Swiss man that I made friends with who really wanted to finish the trail. I agreed to make it to the end with him. I was trying to do the second half of the Apple, the whole Appalachian Trail. And um, I got terrible, I got terrible um, stress fractures in my pelvis and I could not go further. So I rented an SUV to help him get to the end. I picked, drop him off at the trail, pick, pick him up at the end of the day. We stayed in hotels or hostels. I gave other hikers rides. It was one of the best it, it rides to the trail. 
It was one of the best things. And when he did get to Katahdin, I felt good enough to finish with him. I did climb the mountain. And then I went home and got on <laughs> crutches. I finished it a second time when I finished the whole trail with my husband. Again, I had stress fractures in my knee and was on crutches at home. But it healed and I'm here. Returning home is the most difficult part of long distance hiking. You have grown outside the puzzle and your piece no longer fits. It is true. Hikers always have a big crash coming home because they've been, been on the mountaintop experience, you know, in the fresh air and pushing themselves, meeting fascinating people. Um, but you get through it. I've seen a counselor. I've been on antidepressants. I started yoga more regularly. This. The injuries will pass. I take care of them. I know, as I said, I have um, osteoporosis. I'm going to get back to osteopenia. I do Dr. Lauren Fishman's form of yoga, which reverses very successfully, successfully reverses osteoporosis. I do this four to five night, days a week. I wear a weighted vest on neighborhood walks or a heavy backpack. I eat tons of greens. In summation, Planning, preparation, and perseverance have served me well in my training, food prep on tough trails, um, bad weather, exhaustion, recovery, and returning to real life. It's so worth it. I have many trails ahead of me. The best views come after the hardest climb. The accomplishment that I value the most are the ones that were the most challenging to achieve. And I thank you for sharing all of these with me today. And I'm back. Wow, that was amazing. I mean, I, I mean, you you could and you should write a book, I think. That's what people say, but you know what the title of the book would be? No. I'd rather be hiking than writing, and there would be nothing inside the book. That's, <laughs> That's why I do a blog on the trek, which people are welcome to visit. So uh, uh, Colleen wanted to know, do you ever get scared? And how often does your husband join you on the hikes? Very good questions. Yes, I was scared at first. That's why I was doing uh, practice hikes. And I happened to be with a person then. And that she was an experienced hiker. And that helped. Hiking, camping alone took practice. I started alone in a shelter. Usually there's other people, but it was late autumn. And I got used to being alone in the shelter and then outside of the shelter and then under trees by myself. Uh, my husband, I did the Appalachian Trail in four sections. He joined me the first four or five days of the first three sections. And the generous man did the last week and a half up in Maine, up the most difficult mountain to help me finish, just help me emotionally. And he's going to join me in Colorado, which I'll be doing this summer for the first four days. It's a real treat to have him. Nice. And yeah. she also wanted to know, do you ever get lost or encounter any scary animals? Um, yes, I have wandered off the trail accidentally. It's especially hard in towns when there's, it's hard to find the blazes. Uh, but the app, it works no matter where you are. It's satellite connected. And I just look at my app and the arrow shows which way I'm directed. Being to, I'm facing and I see which way I have to turn to get on the trail. And um, let's see, scary animals. I count myself fortunate. I have seen 17 bears on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, mostly I've seen their bottoms as they heard me coming. They scamper out of the tree and run away. They don't want me, they want food, but you have to be a smart camper. You have to guard, it's best not to eat at the campsite. That's hard to pull off because bears can smell everything. And really you have to watch out for the mini bears, M-I-N-I bears, the raccoons, the mice, all of those, the chipmunks, they want your food and just as much. That's why I bought an ursac that is protective against critters and bears. And maybe, maybe the um, odor-proof bag works for the little animals. I don't know. Uh, but I've not had any scary encounters. There was a rattler across the trail. Um, and I just waited for him to move on. I count myself fortunate to see animals. Wow. L Lynn says, what was the scariest animal you saw? So was it the rattler? The first was the first bear. It was during... My first 
time on the Appalachian Trail for, it was my first quarter of the Appalachian Trail. My husband was with me and I heard a rustling in the bushes on the left and I didn't know yet anything. And then I turn and I wait and it's a bear and he's coming towards me. And I take my poles and no, no bear, no bear. And he quickly turns, he must've been in the bushes, you know, eating berries or something. And he turned away and ran away. He wasn't coming for me. He was trying to get around the bush to get away from me, I know. But that scared me. But I was really proud of not running and screaming and crying and wetting my pants. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. So yeah. says you mentioned hummus, powdering it into a hummus after dehydrating. Did you also say you have salsa powder? Yes, I I dehydrate things. I'd love to show your reader someday how I do all this. Yeah, I dehydrate. You, back, you know, seriously, I would love yes. to come back from a separate episode. Oh, yeah. And show us that. It would be amazing. For sure. And the reason I'm so interested, Ruth, is I recently had Alyssa Maris and Nate Maris on, and they're, they're raw fooders. And they, oh. don't dehydrate, they do dehydrate, but they have something called a freeze dryer. And they yes. that blew my mind. So I'm yes. curious, like, do, do you prefer dehydrating over freeze drying? Uh, the hummus first or the salsa, if this is my Paraflex tray, I just smet, spread it smooth, put it in the dehydrator, let it dry for about uh, five hours. And when it's crispy enough, then I flip it over and put it on the mesh tray and let it continue. And the hummus and the salsa, either one, or like a soup, a cream soup. I do that all the time. And then I put it in the food processor and grind it to hell. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to visualize. I, I have the nine tray Excalibur. I went to live yeah. in like, it's a raw culinary school and I've never tried to do salsa or hummus, but I'm trying to think like my soups, like, wouldn't it kind of fall off the tef teflex? Like, do you, yes. Do you if it's liquidy, I blend a lot of veggies in mine so that it's like a thick, thick sauce. I got it's it. Like, makes... It's like hummus would be if you bought it that only a little, sense. a little more solid, a little solid. That makes and then sense. I add more veggies because, you know, it's as doctor um, or all the doctors say, you know, eat the whole food, not just the puree. Don't do smoothies all the time. Um, but dehydrating and freeze drying, freeze drying destroys fewer of the nutrients. It's not the heat and the air is not destroying nutrients in food. So freeze drying is healthier and you get most of your nutrients from it. It does not shrink the food is my understanding. Dehydrating, you are left with about 70% maybe of your nutrients because of the heat in the air, but it does shrink the food. A dehydrator costs $250. I know. A freeze dryer is over 2000. I know, I I'm, I'm looking into one. Shrink my food. Yep. Absolutely. So I feel that if I'm eating 70% of these nutrients that I would be eating at home if I ate it raw, I am still way ahead of the game. So Absolutely. I'm sticking with my dehydrator for yeah. my purposes. Yeah. Tammy wants to know what bear canister you use. Um, let me get it. It's called the Barricade. And I've got stickers on it, um, different hikes I've done. And it has screws on the top that you use a quarter with. And bears don't have quarters. <laughs> and you take off the lid and that's what you put your food in. This is the stomach. Called the scout, the scout, and I can fit about the. I eat so much because you know it's not caloric rich. I I eat so much I can fit three and a half four days food in there That's maybe. Amazing. And so I, so I go with that black bag. I can put a lot more. I can really cram it. When you're not hiking, when you're at home, do you eat pretty much the same except that it's not dehydrated? Pretty much the same. Oatmeal seven days a week. It's in a mixing bowl, so big. <laughs> my lunch, actually, my breakfast is veggies for breakfast, as you say. I start with cooked leafy greens and I add potatoes. I add whatever's in the refrigerator corn, peas, carrots, mushrooms. Always, I love mushrooms. If I have sprouts I've made, I add salsa, I add, always add vinegar, a bit of vinegar to activate the greens. Um, and that would be my breakfast kind of light because then I go exercise at the Y or go for a walk or something later. And then at lunch, I have my second breakfast, the oatmeal and a nice hearty snack in the afternoon with greens and things. And then dinner, curries, we love curries. I don't do much pasta. 
I really take it apart that we eat the whole food, the rice, the potatoes. Um, I, I eat gluten-free. So yeah, it's, it's wonderful. I have started cutting back on my dinners because uh, they were just too full. And I had, I'll say a lot of gas and bloating at night. And it, it helps when I cut back and when I chew really carefully. I have a little sign I put by my place where I eat. It says chew slowly. And I try to make it into a smoothie in my mouth uh, because I want to be comfortable. I love this food so much. If the gas never goes away, so be it. I'm eating this way and I'm living alone away from people <laughs> with the gas. That's fantastic. Yeah, please come back and show us that. Tammy wants yeah. to see what's in your backpack as well. I just want to ask you, how much time do you stay at home in between hikes? Um, the plan right now is January every year this next two years and actually three more years January the whole month will be hiking in Florida and then in the summer I have uh you know about a four day a four week hike the Buckeye Trail I'll go out for a week at a time so I don't like to be gone for a month my husband and I have been together for 50 years I like the man I don't I don't feel like it contributes to a good marriage to be gone much more. He's totally supportive. He's super active on his own. He's a triathlete. He's a cyclist. And he has lots of um, community service that he does. Amazing. So I don't know that he notices I'm gone, except when nobody's by him in bed. But I want to be here. Yeah, he um, sounds, sounds like a great guy. How easy was it to get him on board with a plant-based diet? The man is so agreeable. He said, okay. <laughs> what did, what, did you ever hear about a vegan or a plant-based diet before you changed your diet? I was vegan about five years ago, but you know, the other kind of vegan. Um, and I saw no difference in it, no difference. And my doctor said, I don't think you're getting enough protein. And she had me on tons of supplements. I changed doctor. I changed, dropped the supplements with the approval of my present, Dr. Amy Meckley in Cincinnati. Uh, doctor who is also he's she's trained under Esselstyn my doctor trained under Esselstyn uh, so no my husband I said you know was I said I can't cook meat anymore or buy it but if you want to you're welcome to and he knew I was serious and um, and so he he's no fool it was COVID he didn't feel like doing that I cooked for him and our taste buds changed and we god last night we had split pea soup and we had chickpea omelets from Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease Cookbook. And it was bliss in the mouth. We love this food. I don't, I know that we don't have time to look at the whole backpack. But you know, Ruth, 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 let's, let's just have you come back and yes. do the backpack show and the dehydrating show. Okay. How about we do that? You don't have to convince me on that. Yeah, let's do, they, they kind of go together, don't you think? They do. They yeah, do. so it's let's because this way I can this way I can take you have you take a few more questions. But seriously, I love questions. Yeah, love contact them. text me as soon as we're done. We'll get you on as soon as possible because I'd Thank love you. to see that show. But Thank I'm curious, you. and people are also curious when your husband changed his diet, did his performance improve? Did he notice any improvements in his health? Yes, he lost the aches and pains in the back, and that was the immediate thing. He lost about 20 pounds. I wouldn't have said he was heavy before, but boy, the guy looks good. Um, he, that was most of it. Uh, his, I think his triathlon performance is going to really improve. He also has a coach now, so that helps. Um, he doesn't follow it as religiously. He has snack crackers and things like that. Take, likes a protein powder, I think, because it's sweet in his oatmeal but the man eats better than 99.9% .9 of the people out there. That's so yeah. have you inspired any of the hikers you meet on the trail to, to eat more plants? It's a good question. Interestingly enough, they are the part of the public sector that are the most interested on Florida trail, tons of questions. I don't cram it. I've gotten better. I don't cram it down people's throats. now. Uh, I never mention it to my children, try to convert them anymore, which they didn't. So yes, uh, I had the distinct pleasure of cooking for a year for a friend who had colon cancer. I suggested she go plant-based, she accepted, and I offered to cook for her. So I cooked her dinners for a year, uh, uh, three days a week, I'd make a double batch. She's no longer with us, but she told me that 
she couldn't have survived the chemo that the way she did without eating that way. And she loved it. She loved it. So she was converted and a few other, few other people have kind of dip into it. It's hard. It's hard not to be a bleeding heart and want to convert everybody. Yeah. But you have to just be an example. Paula says you're such an inspiration. And Anne says most amazingly inspirational gal ever. She grew uh, up as a backpacker. She said, if you buy the book, uh, if you write the book, she'll buy it. And do you like have a cell phone with you when you hike? Like for emergencies? Yes, 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 yes. I do have an iPhone and, and I have that um, in reach mini or the spot. Uh, and yeah, on the cell phone, I get, I have, um, I, I get pretty good reception. Yeah. Pretty good you know, you know, can I ask you a question? Were you a really good student in school? I have a feeling you were, and I'm going to tell you why I say that in a minute, but were you? Yeah, I'm kind of anal about things. Yes. Yeah. Well, well I, we use a different word. Dr. Lyle says hyper conscientious. The reason I ask there is uh, because, because it, there's about a six month waiting list to get on Chef AJ Live. And we send out a form to everyone or the people that, uh, that work for us with 12 questions. I have never had anybody <laughs> do as thorough I mean, you basically, this is your book. This could be your book. I, I was just so impressed. Oh, here's an interesting question. Joan says, well, how do you keep your cell phone charged? Very good question. Very, very good question. I wondered about that too myself. I have an Anchor 10,000 uh, portable battery pack and I charge it in town. And sometimes if I'm going to be gone long um, between trail towns, when I can charge, recharge it, I will take two. Um, and that's it. I have a cord and I, I have a headlamp that needs recharging. The, um, uh, the satellite communicator doesn't need much recharging. Uh, I don't track my mileage on there or anything. But yeah, with, I use that. That's great. Well, this has been wonderful. And let's get you booked as soon as possible. Thank we'll you. For any other questions that we didn't get to in the chat, we'll show your backpack and you'll teach us how we can dehydrate, awesome. especially these more liquidy things, because I didn't know you could do that. Yeah, just thicken them up a lot. Yep. Nice. Well, you look great and I know you thank feel you. great. Thank, thank you so thank much you. for coming on the show. Thank you. I'm going to go take a walk around the block now. You've got me charged up. Okay. Well, you know, <laughs> you like vinegar and you're getting two free bottles just for being on the show. Yes, yes. I've already planned what I'll ask for. Thank you, Chef AJ. Oh, Such thank you, Ruth. Ruth, you were amazing. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow for none other than Dr. Joel Furman. He is going to be talking about longevity and I'm sure he'll be happy.